Thank you, Esme, for that enlightening um, overview. Um, I'm saying it because I know that Esme is in fact on our call today and will be available um, to answer any questions that you have for her um, at the end of the event. Uh, and again, put those questions in the Q&A box. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce um, our moderator, Dr. Marjorie Wiesman, and three participants, all who have contributed essays to the publication, as you heard from Emily. Um, Betsy, as she is better known, was appointed curator and head of the Department of Northern European Paintings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 2019, after serving as curator at both the Cleveland Museum of Art, I think you were there before and after the National Gallery, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and then also the National Gallery of Art in London, as Esme has outlined for us. Um, she is joined today by Dr. Margaret Laster, former Associate Curator of American Art at the New York Historical Society, who is currently serving as a publication consultant for the Frick Center for the History of Collecting. Uh, next, we have Dr. Adam Aker, who is Assistant Curator in the Department of European Paintings in the Met. Trapal Museum of Art after serving as a Mellon Fellow here and co-curating the Frick's widely acclaimed 2016 exhibition, Van Dyke, The Anatomy of Portraiture, which was on display during the 2016 symposium. So that was great. And then um, finally, we have Dr. Ann Woolett, uh, curator in the Department of Paintings at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Thank you to all of you for agreeing to be on our panel today and especially Betsy for moderating. Thanks, Louisa, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel. I'm just going to give a few brief words of introduction and then um, turn it over to our speakers. I'd like to welcome you all here to the book launch, and thanks to the Frick for, first of all, for hosting the initial seminar, and then also for their continuing interest in the topic and support of it, and to the general delegation of the government of Flanders and Flanders House for um, helping us with this virtual book launch. I'd like the panel discussion today to encompass a lot of different material. We may not get all to all of it, but I'd like to focus on some of the different perspectives on collecting Flemish painting in the U.S. from the early 19th century today to today, both um, initially with private collectors and then more laterally with institutions. What were the goals and priorities of some of these entities? What were their particular triumphs and challenges? What place do collections of Flemish paintings have as institutions today navigate the changing priorities of the 21st century audiences? Um, but I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not sure that we'll be able to get to all of these topics, but maybe we can in the questions afterwards. Um, but I was hoping to use this opportunity of the panel discussion to um, address and build on some of the topics that were covered so eloquently in the splendid volume just published. And I'd like to begin by asking Margaret, um, if she can introduce us to two very important 19th century, early 19th century collectors, uh, Lumen Reed and Thomas Jefferson Bryant, and speak a little bit about the challenges they faced in assembling collections of Flemish paintings on the other side of the Atlantic. Margaret. Okay, thank you so much, Betsy. And I am, I'm really delighted as an Americanist to be um, with this, uh, such a distinguished scholars of, of Flemish art. And, um, and I also want to extend my gratitude to my colleagues at the Frick um, who organized this, this terrific event. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to begin with a little bit of background. I know Esme whetted our appetite a bit in, in her uh, wonderful overview about my, my collectors and this period, and then um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that they, that they faced, as, as, you, um, as you requested. At the start of America's first full century of independence, the serious pursuit of art collecting beyond the commissioning of family portraits was in its nascent stage. 
The interest in old master paintings, including the work of Flemish artists on the part of individual collectors in New York in the first half of the 19th century was inextricably connected to an underlying tension that existed in the Young Republic. Although the trajectories of their collecting patterns would differ, two notable collectors, Lumen Reed and a generation later, Thomas Jefferson Bryan, incorporated works they thought to be by Flemish old masters into their holdings. And in so doing, each had to confront the issue of which cultural model they should follow, adopting the erudite taste of their European forebears or helping to patronize a new school of American artists. And I would argue that the answer for both individuals lies somewhere between these paradigms. It is important to note that during these pre-Civil War years, buyers and dealers characteristically conflated um, paintings of Flemish and Dutch origin sometimes using these very, these geographic markers interchangeably to describe the same works of art. And this taste may have been engendered by an American admiration for what was perceived as Netherlandish hardiness and a lack of pretension. America in the early 1800s, having wrested itself from the rules of kings, possessed a self-consciously democratic sensibility. Flemish paintings individual buyers chose were for the most part not in the Grand Baroque style of a Rubens or a Van Dyck. Moreover, collectors were more interested in individual artists than schools of painting and particularly popular were genre paintings of everyday life by such artists as David Teniers the Younger or others working in his style. And in this context, this taste gave validity to the painting of scenes of everyday life. And may I have the next image, please? So I'm just gonna give a, just a very quick flyover. Um, as Esme mentioned, Lumen Reed um, was a self-made dry goods merchant who was best known for his pioneering patron of American landscape painters but he began his all too brief collecting career purchasing European art, um, including the work of Flemish and Dutch old masters, uh, many of whose attributions have not you know, uh, withstood the test of time. Um, and the, what the assemblage I have here were among the works that would have been on view on the walls of his Greenwich Street uh, residence, his gallery. And he also owned engravings by, um, by uh, Van Dyck and Rubens among many artists, which he used as more of a study collection. Reed never traveled overseas. And so he relied on others, particularly his son-in-law to bring prints back, back to him. So he used the engravings for pedagogical purposes, but he um, wished his paint, paintings collection to be, of, to be of original works works of art. And here is kind of where one of his challenges lay, is that um, the art market was very unestablished. It was very new. It was in its infancy at that time. So one couldn't always rely on getting works of, receiving works of art that were by the artist who, whom they claimed. And Reed in particular had a falling out with his dealer, Michael Paff, over the what Reed thought was the inauthenticity of various works claimed to be the, the hand of Teniers. So um, I would argue that due to his own cultural nationalism, as well as um, his dissatisfaction with the with the with the, the nascent art market, he um, swip pivoted to collect American art instead. And in so doing, I believe he transferred his affinity for genre painting to such artists as William Sidney Mount, who's the truant gamblers we see on the upper right. And he would say, I do not believe the Flemish artist David Teniers ever did anything better than parts of this picture. And, but, but I will close on Reed by saying that in the last year of his life in 1835, he was able to get access to this painting in the center of the Huntsman's Tent, then attributed to Jan Feit. And he, he argued, he, he spoke very, um, very warmly about that painting as the subject I do not admire, 
but as a work of art, it is very first rate. I am now a believer in the old masters. May I have the next image, please? And, uh, and Thomas Jefferson Bryan, as Esme pointed out, he's from Philadelphia, he was born a generation later, and he spent several decades in Europe, primarily living in Paris, where he witnessed two revolutions, 1830 and 1848. And these revolutions became the source of his international collecting inventory, um, where he was able to get a hold of works that had formerly been in royal or noble, noble hands. And he had, uh, he had a very international collection, but his Flemish and Dutch holdings comprised about one third of his pictures, over a hundred paintings, and included works by Van Eyck, Van Dyck, Rubens, Rembrandt, and the perennial David Teniers, whom we see in, in the center, um, his incantation scene. And um, he, he, Brian spoke of loving the, uh, the dark colors, the dark tones of the, of the Flemish paintings. And um, he also was a print collector. And um, so it's interesting to sometimes compare his paintings with his prints and you see similar themes. Um, and the print that I show here is believed to also be by Teniers. Um, Brian believed that his taste for European holdings would elevate the taste of his fellow American citizens. And he was out of the country during the time when Reed was collecting, when, as I mentioned, Reed grew very dissent great dissatisfaction with the art market. And I didn't mention that there was a whole um, art press um, that was warning American purchasers about the, the, the downfalls of collecting works by old masters that they might not be authentic. Um, Brian was out of the country then, so he um, did not, um, you know, fall to that, you know, was not concerned about, about um, authenticity in, this, in the same way. Um, he came back to the United States. He also began collecting American art too. And he established the uh, gallery, the Bryan Gallery for Christian Art, which, which spanned from the Middle Ages through the 19th century, including Dutch and Flemish works. And he was unable after, to find a permanent home for his gallery after moving around to several locations in New York. So um, in, in the late 1860s, uh, his collection was, pla was placed at the New York Historical Society, where the Lumen Reed collection had already been deposited a decade earlier. And I show you here a installation photograph from the uh, Bryan Gallery at the New York Historical Society. And you see, uh, I wanted to point out uh, among the, the treasures on view in Brian's gallery was a work believed to be by Peter Paul Rubens, St. Catherine, um, now attributed to the School of Rubens, uh, prominently displayed. So um, uh, it's, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's just uh, these installation photographs really uh, are, are wonderful archival uh, art devices that we have to recreate the collections. So thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, some really fascinating issues are raised about um, uh, problems with dealing with authenticity and fakes mm -hmm. and forgeries. And um, I hope we'll be able to get to those in a minute. Absolutely. But um, another topic that you touched on was also something that I know Adam was very interested in. And that is the role of um, prints and en engravings and copies after um, artists like uh, Rembrandt, uh, sorry, Rubens and Rubens. Van Dyck. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is particularly evident um, with Van Dyck that Americans had encounters with the artist primarily through um, graphic works before mm -hmm. that they actually encountered um, the real thing, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and Adam, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the role of um, these kind of lesser works of art in creating a taste for the artist. 
Absolutely. And, and that was something that was a real revelation to me working on this project as someone who's a specialist in Flemish and British art and has spent most of my career at Gilded Age institutions, um, the Met, the Frick. So I was familiar with this story of American robber barons going and pillaging European collections, bringing back these trophies, like what you see on the far right, um, Anthony Van Dyke's uh, portrait of the Duke of Lennox and Richmond, one of our treasures here at the Met. Um, so that was sort of how I thought of the American reception of Van Dyke. And it was a real eye opener for me to learn that already in mid 18th century Boston, you had a painted copy, what you see um, on the slide by, by John Smybert, a painted copy of Van Dyke's great portrait of Cardinal Bentivoglio that was perhaps the most celebrated and studied painting in colonial Boston. Um, so this is something that the young John Singleton Copley is fascinated by. Um, he's clearly responding to in his, his breakthrough picture, Boy with Flying Squirrel, that he sends off to London to be displayed at the Royal Academy. This is really the focal point um, for, for young ambitious artists in 18th century Boston. And it's not an original work. It's, it's a copy, and I think from our current vantage point, we might even say a not particularly impressive copy, but one that, that absolutely captivated this colonial public. Um, and it very much contradicts our ideas of visual culture and impure in Boston to think that a portrait by a Flemish artist of a Roman Catholic cardinal was being studied by all these um, Puritan Bostonians as, as the greatest painting in the city. And I mentioned this only in passing in my essay, but it's also important to keep in mind that um, the parts of, of what is now the United States that were then under Spanish rule, so present day New Mexico, also saw emulation of Van Dyck, particularly through devotional prints. So already by the late 18th century, Van Dyck devotional images are being copied on uh, New Mexican hide painting. Um, so there's a whole fascinating history of, of this reception that is really outside of that narrative of the great trophies bought um, during the Gilded Age. And right. I also- kind of Two separate strands that we don't really acknowledge the other one. We're focused on, you know, these beautiful society images Right, and, and what fascinated me is that I think these uh, Gilded Age collectors, they were primed to seek out uh, wonderful aristocratic Van Dyke portraits because he was already, to a certain extent, a household name in the early United States. They knew that he was um, the so-called founder of the English school, uh, a status accorded him by subsequent generations of English portraitists, and he really embodied a certain kind of elegance, aristocratic self-possession. So the the American elites who um, were very much gripped by Anglophilia, who wanted to adopt some of the refinement of English aristocratic life, very much did so through purchases of, of Van Dykes or, or pseudo Van Dykes. And I wanted to include this wonderful photograph um, from the very end of the 19th century of an English aristocrat attending a masquerade ball in a kind of Van Dykean pastiche. And through the 18th and 19th century, Van Dyke dress was by far the most popular masquerade costume in the English speaking world. So not only could people acquire Van Dyke portraits if they could afford them, but they also would literally dress up as Van Dyke portraits. And it was a way to associate oneself with, with this very prestigious pedigree. Beautiful. Um, I, I imagine that, um, you know, in, in a lot of our ancestral photos, if we should be so lucky, there's somewhere an ancestor trying to look like a Van Dyke portrait. Um, I, I know as, um, as a child, as soon as I found out about Van Dyke, I wanted to look like one of those elegant ladies. Um, <laughs> um, one other question that um, I think this raises is about 
um, you know, how do we go about addressing some of the, um, and if you could just maybe say this very briefly, um, the impact of the, the religious imagery, you know, not specifically the portraits that I think we're a little, all a little more familiar with, but, you know, how, how do we begin to address and incorporate other types of imagery and the impact Van Dyke and Rubens had? Well, I think, as others have noted, the religious imagery, the Catholic imagery was a, was a harder sell for a majority Protestant American audience, but it is important to note that there was a major Van Dyke devotional picture, his um, St. Rosalie interceding for the mm -hmm. plague stricken of Palermo. That was part of the founding 1871 purchase of the Met. So there already was an awareness on the part of our early trustees that this was a very important facet of the history of art that needed to be represented. It's a painting that was singled out by Henry James in his review of the the first exhibition of the museum as one of the strongest works in the collection. And it remains one of our great Flemish pictures. You can see it on view if you're in New York and you come to our current exhibition, Making the Met, as one of the, the first great old master pictures that, that entered the collection and has really sustained its repu reputation for the past 150 years. Great. Um, as soon as we can get there, we'll do it. I think a lot of the um, uh, discrepancy also comes down to how um, Rubens and Van Dyck were marketed in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and I think that Van Dyck's portraits, because of their sort of anglophilic connection, were particularly attractive. And um, Rubens, I think, was often a more difficult sell. And I know this was something Anne was interested in as well. And maybe um, she'd like to, you and she would like to pick apart some of the reasons why, um, what made Van Dyck so popular and Rubens so difficult. And why don't you uh, jump in there? Um, well, thank you. Uh, you know, I worked on a group of collectors that um, are far closer to our own time than um, to the early founding of the Metropolitan, for example. So, um, you know, they, someone like J. Paul Getty um, was approached by Joseph Duveen, you know, in a very calculating way. Um, it, it seemed to me from the material that I was able to access that, um, you know, Duveen was looking for a way to um, kind of start a market for Rubens. Um, and in, in Getty, he found someone who was ambitious and liked drama and sensuality and, and beauty. Um, and, you know, he, Getty already owned um, an important Rembrandt. So, um, you know, that trajectory was sort of started in a kind of specific way because I think Getty's personality. Um, and I just, I just point out, because we were seeing here an image of um, Getty's home, Sutton play, um, Place in Surrey, you know, he, after the sort of mid -50, early 50s, he lived in England entirely. He did not come back to the United States, but he began to buy works of art specifically for the new Getty Museum um, eventually. So um, his um, decisions were based a little bit on what a museum Rubin should be. <laughs> um, but that's not to say he didn't have a real affinity for the artist. Um, and I, I really found it moving in a way to read through all of these diary entries with these sort of exclamation points and things he responded personally to certain images. And the one we see here is very well known where he's being interviewed. Um, and uh, you can see to the far left, the um, Rubens and workshop, Diana and her nymphs on the hunt. Um, and if we, if we would go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll just say uh, very briefly something about this pairing, which is quite well known, I think, to many of us that um, there were two versions of this composition that emerged in the same time. And um, I think it's great, Betsy, that I can talk to you about this because uh, you are <laughs> you are very well acquainted with the beautiful Cleveland painting, um, which I think was three years it had been um, it was acquired three years before Getty was introduced to the one, the painting he would buy. Um, and it, it caused kind of a kerfuffle because um, someone like Ludwig Burkhardt, who had been this um, exceptionally important expert for so many um, potential buyers over the decades, it was 
kind of in later, later stages of life. Um, and he had seen the painting that Cleveland ultimately purchased at one point and then was a little bit flummoxed when the, uh, a French dealer um, offered the, the painting to Mr. Getty. Um, and, uh, you know, Getty himself just made his own decision in a sense. He relied on the advice he received from, from different art historians and connoisseurs, but he liked his painting. <laughs> he was committed to telling everyone that it was the better of the two. Um, and um, I show here, um, with the gracious permission of our conservation studio and Ulrich Berkmeyer, um, our painting, which uh, we are in the process of, of cleaning um, ahead of the exhibition next year. Um, and it's been released from the yellow varnish that we saw in the image that Esme had access to. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it has emerged as a, a very um, attractive composition with nice, um, kind of landscape, um, have, you know, seen through the back, there's much better sense of space now. Um, but it, you know, it hasn't changed for me at any rate, the um, understanding that it's largely a workshop painting. No, it's, it's fascinating. And, um, you know, the role of scholars and advisors in forming these um, the major American collections, particularly with someone like Getty or Ringling, who were such forceful personalities in um, the first half of the 20th century, with such an affection, um, demonstrated affection for Northern painting. You know, the role of people like Burkhart and Held in um, crafting those collections is really um, a fascinating one. Um, in, I know we're a, a little bit over our time here, so I'm just going to ask all three of my gracious panelists um, for their thoughts on one question. And that um, is uh, just one sentence or two sentences. We all love Flemish painting of the 17th century. And, you know, for us, it lives and breathes and is an endless source of you know, excitement and inspiration and just, you know, heartwarming goodness. Um, how do we keep our museum audiences engaged in, Dutch, in Flemish painting of the 17th century? What are the um, aspects that you hope to get across to your audiences? And Anne, since you're on my screen right now, I'll ask you first. <laughs> um, I found that many of our visitors respond as I do with a kind of joyful, visceral pleasure to Rubens um, due to scale and color and just fabulous narrative um, and the kind of the storytelling aspect. So I think you know, ways and, uh, you know, projects that highlight those aspects of his art um, are a great way to um, help people understand sort of what that Baroque experience was. Great, couldn't agree more. Um, Adam or Margaret, want to take a stab? Adam? Sure, I absolutely agree that the sensory appeal um, is often all you need, but at the same time, I work very hard to remind our audiences um, that 16th and 17th century Antwerp was a, a globalized city. It saw the first stock market, the first recognizable art market. It had the uh, one of the largest populations of people of African descent in early modern Europe. It um, saw many independent professional women artists like Clara Peters who were actively working to represent more in our collection. So I think that we can tell new stories about Flemish art, not necessarily centered on the trio of Rubens, Van Dyck, and Jordans that can engage a contemporary audience in a new way. Fabulous. Margaret, anything you'd like to add? Um, you're muted, Margaret. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. I mean, I, I am not a, a curator of, of 17th century Flemish art. I'm a fan, but I, I've really enjoyed through, through this project really kind of teasing out these New York stories um, from, from, from the past and from the 19th century and really coming at Flemish art, Flemish art that way. And I, one thing I was just wondering, um, maybe this is more 
question to the to the other panelists or something to think about is if you wanted to look at Flemish art through um, a pairing, say, with a contemporary artist today, kind of how you can tell stories about our, our own time through through Flemish art or vice versa, use contemporary artists to tease out stories. I'm thinking of say Kahinde Wiley, who's done a lot of work with old masters or others. Do you have any ideas? I mean, if you had to create an exhibition pairing a, a Flemish master with a with a contemporary artist today, you know, what what ideas might come to mind? I just think that those are interesting, interesting questions. I'm particularly thinking of portraiture, you know is would be a a, a, a wonderful um tool um but so maybe i'll leave that for thought <laughs> <laughs> stay yeah. tuned um thank you all i'm going to hand it, the virtual floor back to louisa who i think will introduce the last portion of the program <laughs>